Good morning, everybody. It is Sunday at around nine o'clock, coming to you from a very, very quiet Nicosia, Cyprus. It is quiet because last night we had at midnight our Easter liturgy, and that is when uh, everyone of the Orthodox religion, the Greek Orthodox religion, they go to church at midnight. And uh, when it turns midnight, everyone uh, says Christ has risen, or in Greek, they say Christos Anesti, and uh, in Russian, it is Christos Voskres. What is it in your language? Those who are celebrating Easter, let me know what it is in your language. I'm genuinely interested. But um, in the Orthodox religion, it is Easter today. And so when people go to the midnight mass, well, on Sunday morning, most everything is closed and it's very, very quiet. I imagine in about an hour, it's uh, nine o'clock here, I imagine in about an hour, things will start to open up and uh, people will start to go out and they'll visit family. And uh, the big deal about today, this Sunday, is that uh, the fasting has ended. So for, for us in, uh, in Cyprus and in Greece, it means that we can uh, eat meat and uh, food made from animal, um, what, what, what do you say, animal products? Yeah, like milk and cheese and eggs. And, uh, and meat, a lot of meat today. That's what we're gonna be eating, a lot of meat. So let's get to our first story. And, uh, and I wish everyone a very, very happy Sunday, wherever you are in the world. Let's get to our first news story. And it has to do with Russia and Ukraine. And I'm going to need to, I'm going to kneel down, kneel. I'm going to kneel right here, or at least park it right here because I'm gonna have to read. Um, a quote for, our, for, for the first story and uh, it's a strange place to be kind of a building that's under construction here but anyway it'll do it'll do because I can't find the park bench right now so the first story that uh, we have to talk about is the Russian Ministry of Defense and they have uh, come out with a statement yesterday and they said that Ukraine and the collective West is planning and plotting a provocation, i.e. a false flag. And they're looking to do something um, devastating, truly devastating and evil to, to then pin the blame on Russia and to somehow save the, the Ukraine military and the Alensky regime, which is being soundly defeated by the uh, Russian military. Even Boris Johnson, when he was in India, finally conceded that uh, Russia might be winning the war. Remember, this is Boris Johnson, who just last week was talking about how Russia has to be defeated by all means necessary, more weapons, more money to Ukraine, and that Russia will lose the war, and the, uh, the collective West will not rest until Russia is defeated. And he was confident with the fact that Russia would lose. Well, when he was in India, Boris Johnson admitted that, you know, Russia is kind of winning. He actually said Russia might win the war. Give it one more week and Boris Johnson will be coming out with a statement saying, yeah, Russia is going to win the war. Right now, he is drip feeding the, uh, the public to the fact of, uh, of Russia's military uh, victory, Russia's progress in this military operation. He's drip feeding people. I call it trickle truth. He's kind of letting the truth out just a little bit, a little bit at a time. So we had the Russian Ministry of Defense and they came out with a statement yesterday and they said that there are three scenarios that are being discussed with regards to some sort of provocation and false, false flag from the collective West and from the Alensky regime. Now, how they have this information, the Russian Ministry of Defense is obviously saying uh, they've used uh, various intel operations and various sources and, uh, and Ukraine soldiers and military planners who have been captured or surrendered, and they've come up with these three scenarios. So the Russian Ministry of Defense says there are three scenarios planned for the Russian Federation accusation. The first one is a staged incident under a false flag. That is the most probable. This could include a real use of chemical and biological weapons, 
that would cause deaths among the population or stage or staging sabotages from Russia at the facilities of Ukraine involved in the development of components for weapons of mass destruction. The second one refers to a maximally covert use of weapons of mass destruction in small volumes for neutralizing the willpower and the capacity to resist within the fulfillment of a particular operational task. This scenario was supposed to be implemented in Azovstal. The third and the least probable one is the overt use of weapons of mass destruction at a combat area in case of failure to succeed in using conventional, conventional armaments in the combat zone. This scenario was considered for Slavyansk and Kramatorsk that had been transformed into fortified towns. So this is kind of taken from, from the Russian and translated over, so it's a little, a little rough, but I think everyone gets the point. Three provocations planned. The most probable one is some sort of chemical or bio attack. The second one is uh, a tactical nuke, <laughs> a tactical uh, nuclear weapon in small volumes for mass destruction in small volumes. And this was something that the Russians believed was gonna be used at Azovstal. And the third one is something much, much bigger, a much bigger type of, uh, of weapon of mass destruction in a combat zone. So those are the three provocations that the Russian Ministry of Defense was talking about. They mentioned that they were planning something to happen during the Easter festivities, which would be yesterday, today, and like I said, perhaps tomorrow. But uh, I think if nothing happens today during one of those, uh, those celebrations, then I don't think anything would happen tomorrow either with regards to that, to that narrative, to that story. And so you have the warning and this very much falls in line with many of the statements coming out of the collective West. We've heard from many leaders in the collective West that Russia is planning some, some sort of tactical nuclear strike or something along those lines. We've heard this for the first time via Burns at the CIA. Then we heard Elensky parrot it as well. Many times, Elensky has said this many times that Russia is gonna be using a tactical nuke. We've heard this from Saki and Biden and the State Department. And uh, most recently we heard it from uh, Victoria Newland. Cookies Newland was giving an interview at a publication called European Pravda and she was talking about how Russia will be planning or is currently planning some sort of tactical nuke strike. And uh, she said that should Russia decide to do something like this, well, then they would pay, and I quote, an astronomical price for uh, using some sort of tactical nuke. Now, we heard this about the uh, bio and uh, chemical weapons say about three, four weeks back. And the narrative was that, uh, that was coming out of the collective West. The narrative was, well, Russia is losing so bad in this war. The, uh, the Russian military is in complete disarray. Putin has gone mad. And literally they said Putin had gone mad. Shoigu was supposedly in the middle of, of a heart attack or had already had a heart attack. Russian generals were being assassinated one by one or thrown into gulags and we had Ukrainian uh, babushkas taking out Russian tanks with broomsticks and, uh, and bubble gum. That was literally, and I'm not exaggerating, that was the narrative that we were hearing three, four weeks ago. And because things were going so poorly for the Russians in this military operation, they were going to use chemical and bio weapons to, some, to somehow uh, change the tide of the war and to prevent Elensky from marching into Moscow. That was the narrative three weeks ago. Now we're hearing that the Russians, according to Boris Johnson, might actually win this war and things are not going as, uh, as poorly as the media was saying they were going three, four weeks ago. But now they want to use a tactical nuke because of what reason? This is the part where I think 
their tactical nuke story kind of breaks down. Now, this is obviously projection. And when you hear someone like Victoria Newland or the State Department talk about Russia's use of a tactical nuke, you're obviously uh, seeing projection right in front of you. The Russians call it mirroring. They say that when, uh, when the State Department and the Biden White House or Alensky, they talk about these types of provocations that Russia is up to, all they're doing is uh, mirroring what they're actually up to or what they're planning. So I don't know what they're, what they're thinking. I don't know what these psychopaths at the Department of State are cooking up. Will they use some sort of tactical nuke or something along those lines, some sort of WMD, and blame it on Russia? I guess it's possible. Are they just going to run with a news story of WMD without providing any proof, very much like what they did in Iraq, and then try to get support for some sort of military intervention in Ukraine with just the news headline? That is also possible. I'm going to cross one of the trickiest streets in Cyprus, in Nicosia, because there is no crossing. There's no like green man to green light to say cross, so you just kind of have to have to wing it. But um, yeah, the uh, I made it, no problem. The uh, the possibility of something along those lines with regards to a tactical nuke or just the fiction of using a tactical nuke to get NATO involved is, uh, is very likely, in my opinion. I, I could see them running with another WMD story and then maybe using the media, something that they're very good at because they are winning the soft power war, just using their soft power advantage to, to just you know, inject a lot of fear that Russia's gonna use a WMD and then maybe they can get the support for some sort of, uh, I would say some sort of Polish peacekeeping mission in the west of Ukraine. I could definitely see that happen. That is something that, that is a possibility. I'm not saying it's gonna happen and I hope it doesn't happen, but I think it's something that they could cook up and they don't have to actually use a tactical nuke, just the fear of a tactical nuke and another Colin Powell type of anthrax UN speech and all of that stuff could lead to, to the Polish military believing they can move into the west of Ukraine and, uh, and create some sort of peacekeeping Bandera buffer zone. So talking about soft power and talking about Poland, we actually have the, uh, the Polish government and the Law and Justice Party, Kaczynski and... Uh, and his crew, they are actually putting together a European-wide media campaign called Stop Russia Now. And uh, this makes sense, if you want my opinion, it makes a lot of sense, because if there's one thing that the collective West can actually win at with regards to this war, they're not winning the economic war, they're not winning the, the actual ground war, but if there's one part of the war where they are successful, it is the soft media power. And so if they can convince enough European Union citizens and, and world citizens, if they can, but I think this is specifically designed for the EU, if they can convince enough, pe enough people that uh, Russia needs to be stopped and thus we have to go through double digit inflation, we have to go through food shortages and an energy crisis and maybe even possibly sending European troops into the west of Ukraine, well then, let's, uh, let's do it. Let's go through it because the campaign is called Stop Russia Now. There's going to be billboards and TV ads and internet banners and a social media campaign, the whole thing. They're going to throw all kinds of money at this thing to, uh, to brainwash and propagandize EU citizens so that they're prepared to, uh, to become a lot poorer and to go through a lot of hardship with regard to food and energy and uh, price hikes so that they can stop Russia now. And of course, one of the big parts of this uh, campaign, one of the major components is to prepare European citizens for the possibility of some sort of, uh, of Polish led ground invasion into uh, the West of Ukraine. At least that's what I think they're looking to do. 
And this is going to be a big campaign. I mean, we're hearing from uh, Morawiecki, the prime minister of Poland, saying that uh, the EU capitals have to remind people what is happening in Ukraine. They need to awaken the conscience of the EU bloc. And uh, he singles out some countries, Germany, France, Austria, Italy. These countries must do as much as possible to stop the war in Ukraine. So he's even singling out some countries. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Germany, Austria, those are two countries that have said um, we're not going to be able to cut off Russian gas in the near, in the near term, that's for sure. So you know, there's a lot of pressure to get Germany and Austria to sink their economies in order to stop Putin and to stop Russia now. And that means cutting off the Russian gas. But those are two countries that have said, we just can't do it. We're going to destroy our, our economy. That's simple. So that is the, uh, the soft media power campaign that is going to be put in place. Once again, spearheaded by Poland. And uh, yeah, why not? Like I said, if there's one component to this uh, war where the collective West is winning, it is in the, uh, in the media side of things. So you might as well double and triple down on that. Now, two more short stories and one clown world. We have uh, two American officials that, from what I understand, will be visiting Kiev. I've said that Kiev is the hottest ticket in town. I mean... Everyone that's watching this video, if you haven't made your summer plans yet, well, it looks like Kiev is the place to be. So go on to booking.com and, and close your hotel. <laughs> Book your hotel and uh, get ready to visit Kiev. And most likely, if you visit Kiev, you might actually run into Olensky. Maybe you'll, you'll uh, run into Ursula van der Leyen or Boris Johnson. You could maybe take a selfie with Bojo. Who, uh, <laughs> who could be walking the streets of Kiev, who knows? But two American officials that will be in Kiev are Lloyd Austin, the Defense Secretary, and Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State. And this is not 100% confirmed, but Alensky said that these two American officials will be coming to Kiev in order to sit down with Alensky and uh, discuss the progress of the uh, of the war, and Elensky said at a press conference, he said that uh, I don't think that this is a big secret. The people from the U.S. are coming to us tomorrow. I shall be meeting with the State Secretary, Mr. Blinken, and the Defense Secretary, who are coming to us tomorrow, meaning today, Easter Sunday. Uh, Elensky then said, and this is the best part. He said, tomorrow we will, be we will be discussing the list of weapons which we need. <laughs> you got to hand it to Alensky, man. He is, he's good at his job. I mean, when it comes to reading scripts and, uh, and playing the part of this, uh, of this democratic independence leader who's fighting for the, the salvation of the collective West with his, you know, green green t-shirts and, and stuff like that. He, he plays the part really, really well. And he always manages to slide in there the, the line about, we need more weapons and we need more money. <laughs> it's, you know, that's the sales pitch. That is the sales pitch. At the end of the day, he is just, just a sales guy. You know, he's an actor doing a, a promo commercial. He's doing a, an infomercial and he's doing a damn good job of it because Ukraine's gotten like three, four, five billion from the collective West, I think it's something like five billion in, in cash and, and goodies. So um, yeah, he also said that Kiev has uh, some red lines where if uh, these red lines are crossed, then uh, Kiev will stop negotiating. Not that they're really negotiating now. There are video negotiations taking place on a daily basis, but pretty much the Russians have said that uh, they can't negotiate with Zelensky and his crew because there are a bunch of clowns and Lavrov said that uh, you can't really take anything that uh, Elensky says seriously because he's either drunk or high. But uh, Elensky did say at the same press conference where he uh, said that Blinken and Lloyd Austin will be coming to Kiev, he said that Kiev has some red lines where they will stop the, uh, the negotiation process. And his red lines are if our people are destroyed in Mariupol and if there is a referendum, a pseudo referendum, 
announced in any new pseudo republics in Ukraine. Ukraine then will withdraw from any negotiation process. And that is a direct quote. So those are Elensky's red lines. Once again, Azov style, which I'm going to get to Azov style actually. I want to talk about Azov style a little bit. Um, don't, don't you dare go into Azov style. What is in Azov style? Who knows? We will find out soon enough. But uh, there's Azov style, and then there's the referendum that I have been reporting on for a while now, which is Kherson, and now we're hearing about Zaporozhye. The, uh, we're hearing about a Crimean Republic, a new Crimean Republic or Federation taking place. And there's also rumblings about Kharkov as well, breaking off. So if any of this happens, then Alensky will, will pull out of negotiations, and I'm sure the Russians are very concerned about that. They're not, because they understand that Alensky is not the guy calling the shots, and anything he says can't be taken seriously. The Russians have two objectives, denazification, demilitarization, and uh, they're at war to defeat the Ukraine military, and, and they're doing a, a very good job of it. That is the demilitarization side of things, and uh, the denazification side of things in my opinion, is, is the, uh, the land bridge all the way to Transnistra. That's what I think is the, uh, the denazification side of things. A rump Ukrainian state. But I could be wrong. Maybe, they'll, maybe the Russians will see denazification as going all the way to Lviv and taking out the, uh, the Bandera statue in, uh, in the center of Lviv. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out as well what uh how far the denazification will go elensky did come out with a statement as well yesterday during this press conference now it's all coming to my to my memory what elensky said he also said that uh russia is going to be preparing to uh to attack moldova as well because of the whole odessa and then transnistra land bridge and taking over the whole southern part of ukraine well, Alensky is now warning that after Russia does that, they're going to go after Moldova. Moldova actually called the Russian ambassador in after Alensky made these statements. So that was, uh, that was an interesting um, turn of events there. I, I don't think that, that Russia is interested in Moldova at all. They're definitely interested in creating that, uh, that connection with Transnistria. That's for sure. And they're very, very interested in Odessa. No doubt about that. For many, many reasons. Strategic, cultural, historical. A lot of reasons that they're going to be interested in Odessa. And once again, Odessa plays a key role in the demilitarization, denazification part of uh, the Russian objectives. Remember that in 2000, what was it, 2015, you had that fire at the, uh, the trade the trade union's house where so many um, Russian speakers, people who were against the coup, the, uh, the Victoria Newland coup in, uh, in Ukraine, they were burned alive in this trade union's house by the Azov guys and the NAZIs. And I, I think that was in uh, like around the springtime of 2015, if I'm not mistaken. And that was in Odessa. So there's a lot of symbolism with regards to denazification with uh, Odessa. So let's leave it there and let's get to a quick clown world. And this has to do with Biden announcing that the U.S. military is going to go green. That's right. The U.S. military will go green by 2035. U.S. President Joe Biden has announced a process is underway to make every vehicle in the country's massive military climate friendly, adding, and I quote, we're spending billions of dollars to do it. And this was during an Earth Day celebration. I didn't know it was Earth Day on Friday. According to this article, it was Earth Day on Friday and Biden was in Seattle. He gave a speech at... Uh, Seward Park, Seward Park, and he talked about how the U.S. military, they're developing all kinds of, uh, of kit and gear and vehicles, which will have zero emissions, zero emissions, completely uh, electric, 
And all of this is going to be done by 2035. Now, I don't know how they're going to pull all of this off. I don't know how you're going to have vehicles which are going to be like uh, military vehicles, which are going to be kind of like Teslas and they're going to be electric and you're going to have to charge them up and uh, how you're going to have green weapons. But hey, you know, this is this is Biden. This is the Biden White House. It is driven by ideology. And so that was uh, that was the speech that Biden gave in Seattle. That is the clown world that uh, that we live in. And I will leave it there, everybody. Check out Alexander's channel. Check out the Duran main channel as well, where we're doing all kinds of great live streams all throughout the week. And uh, the Duran.locals.com. Take care, everybody.